this week, exploring the business of security and advancing the security of business. We'll tell you how to improve your pitch, how to solve those problems, and more. So stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Hey everyone, welcome to Startup Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. On the lines via Skype is none other than Michael Santarcangelo. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey brother, always good to be here. Doing it from the beach, as always. Somebody has to. You should get a t-shirt that says doing it from the beach. (laughs) (laughs) It probably already is one. I'll just go to one of our 15,000 t-shirt stores and pick one up. Because everyone needs a t-shirt from the beach. Um, I'm excited about, about, I don't know, the stories this week were just uh, awesome. They really, I was telling Michael earlier and the production guys were all laughing at me. I'm like, in, in like my adult language, they really resonated with me (laughs) in my not so language. I'm like, your stories were wicked awesome, right? (laughs) Um, but we've got, we've got some, uh, some listener feedback, a question. I mean, we've had feedback, but now we have an actual question that came from Twitter that I'm excited to talk about. Yeah, and I like it. Chris J um, at Radis asked us a question, and he said, "Hey, um, how do I?" His his question is, "Can you give me advice on how to start from scratch?" And he said, "I get question one. Here's the problem. I think I solve, but then what? Where where do I find? Or I get good entrepreneurial one on one resources." So, Chris, um, thanks for asking that. And uh, so, I've got a couple thoughts. I know Paul's got a couple thoughts. We added some stories into this week too, specifically, Chris, for you some thoughts on, on how you get started with it. But, but I kind of want to go back to, because what it looks like is the problem that you think that you solve is something around multi-year analytics of area crime showing change in related cause and effect of policing. And so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set aside some of my economics background to not dig into that too much. Mm-hmm. Let me go back to that first question. Right. So the first question is, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And as I've learned a lot this week, there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at and think about that question. Yeah. So I say, what's the problem you're trying to solve? When you're looking at it from, from the perspective of being a startup, it's the start of your story. It's either your why or your how. So what that didn't tell me is, um, what does that mean? How, how did you get to that? Why is that important? Does that matter to other people? What does that lay into from a solution perspective? And so, you know, Paul, one of the things you and I could talk about in, for example, your case, or we could pick something else as an example, is the, you know, how did you come up with that? Um, And I'll throw out some just generic stuff. I'm always fascinated when I come across a startup that says, well, we had experience doing X, Y, Z, and we thought it was applicable here, and we tested it out, and lo and behold, it was. That's a story to me, and yeah. that's a compelling, what problem do you solve? But when you answer it from that startup perspective, it's not just, uh, I make the world a better place, right? <laughs> yeah. I think before you even think about creating a startup, you, and like Michael said, make it personal, like you have a problem. Focus on the solution. Don't focus about thinking about the problem and whether it affects other people. Like, focus on your solution. And I see this a lot in open source software and security, right? This is a security show, and, I, and this really resonated with me. Again, there's that word. And because, you know, oftentimes we're like, yeah, I kind of like, I got this issue, and, and I'm going to go work on the, the solution. And don't get caught up with, oh, I can build a company, do all this thing, and just focus on that. And then take a step back and think about the problem that you're solving, Right. Think about how you're solving it and think about if other people might have this problem. I mean, the greatest open source projects, for example, stemmed from like I had a problem on my own. So I released it and it turns out other people have the same problem. I think that's a really good kind of model to follow. But don't get caught up in all the other stuff in the beginning. Like just focus. And that's, you know, some we've done it offensive countermeasures, right? We're like, wow, it takes a long time and a, a lot of manual effort to do this thing. Like, I wonder right. if we would have, like write some software to help us do that and look at these different methods and spend time exploring the different methods. It, it, maybe you come up short. I mean, look, John and I have a lot of 
crazy crackpot ideas, right? But <laughs> we only have two products, okay? <laughs> so, well, and have you have you seen that uh, yeah. that thing going around Facebook that says if you're worried about your idea, remember somebody in a pitch meeting suggested a movie about sharks <laughs> in a hur- uh, hurricane yes. like setting. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And now we got Sharknado like what thirty seven or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, exactly. So I, you know, that's just kind of. I think people can lose focus um, and, no, and try things point. out in, in the beginning and, and see what works for you because if you can't make it work for you, it's likely not going to work for other people. Yeah, and, and what I like is when you're looking at that solution, really keep it as simple and tight as you can to start because there, you can always add complexity to it later. Mm-hmm. But what I've learned is I, I didn't realize at first I was solving a problem, mm-hmm. especially with the straight talk stuff. I was just more of a gut reaction. The more I talk to people, the more they helped me understand the problem yes. best and problems, and I am so much better off for it. But right. let me throw something else into this. I, I've got this concept. I call it idea to execution. The more I worked with startups, the more I realized a lot of people have ideas. So, Chris, you've got an idea, uh, and that's great. So here, there's, I broke it down into there's five things because you asked about resources, and we're going to share some links and some resources that I think are pretty good. But there's another challenge to it, which is, a lot of these things are very prescriptive. Do it my way. Here's the plan. You've got it. Sometimes it works. Um, but if you find that they're not working, I distill down to five things. I call them the five P's. So if you want to take from your idea to execution, there's five P's. First of which is you got to have a product. So product, a prototype, right? A concept, right? And that's mm-hmm. what Paul was just talking about, the solution. Got to have a solution. You need a pitch. You got to be able to explain it. Now the thing, and we're going to talk about this today too, there's different pitches. Mm. Pitches for investment versus pitches for customers versus pitches to explain it to somebody. So you got to have a pitch. you got to have a plan. The plan is, how am I going to make money? Mm-hmm. And then the two that I like to add into it is you need to have proof. So does it actually work? Show me. Yep. Especially if you're new, especially if you're in security because we oh, are. Oh, yeah. We're sticklers for that. <laughs> we get a little, yeah, we get a little cranky with that. Yeah. And then the fifth one then is the, the protection and that could be as a, do you have a patent? Mm-hmm. Are you protecting your intellectual property? Or it could be what we do traditionally, which is, are you protecting your customer information? Are you protecting your own networks? It, what you'll learn, the more I talk about these types of frameworks, is I'm very comfortable making it simple so you've got a lot of flexibility on how to apply it. So if you read a book that talks about how to do product stuff or how to do mm-hmm. your MVP, kick ass. Use it. Run with it. You got a different book that talks about how to do your pitch. That's awesome. Like it. Yeah, but no realize set. that's going to evolve because I mean, you did that for me early on, Michael. You're like, here's a great example of how to do your pitch, and our initial pitch like mirrored that uh, too closely, <laughs> if you will. Yep. And and now here today, we've got a lot of resources that talk about um, oh. angling your pitch to different people and changing it. And that's what I realized is everyone's pitch is different. I mean, yeah, there's there's a formula, right? I mean, obviously, you, you start with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, I like to jump right to the solution. I think that's important. Um, I think some of the other things where I started modifying it, specifically for security, is I think security is very much uh, a very popular market today. And there's a lot of products that do similar things. And then even more so, there's a lot of solutions that are very similar. And until you dig into the details, you don't realize how differently they're solving the problem. So you have to talk about your differentiators. And those could be those could be different, right? I mean, those can be you're solving the problem better or in a different way in security. And I think that was important for us to talk about in our pitch is like why we're solving the problem this way and what differentiates us from other solutions in the market. And those could be different product categories. To me, that, that, was, that, was, that was good. Um, and I think economic incentive, and this is more geared towards customers, Michael. I think it's good for investors to hear this too. Like you should tell them a little bit about how you pitch it to customers because that's important. Um, but talk about the economic incentive. Like how, and we talked about ROI, right? And that you were like kind of rolling your eyes at the, the acronym. But I, for me, I think it was economic incentive, right? How can this help you yeah, no, I, save like, something here to do it better here? Is it saving time? Is it scaling back on something? You got to talk about some kind of economic incentive because people got to have their checkbook out. I mean, you know, no, our software is not exactly, free. You're, so You're pointing very much to what I talk about with value. What, yeah. What's the value? What's the value of doing this? How does that work out? The reason I roll my eyes at ROI is just because there, there's been so much debate and it's, none of it's been productive in our industry in the last 20 years where we argue you can't do an ROI calculation on security. That's a falsehood. Of course you can. 
-hmm. Is it worth it? No, not normally. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a good practice for somebody who's got an expertise in security, not in finance or economics, trying to do an ROI calculation? No, don't. Yeah, so that's why I just that. go, but I like it. When you talk about an economic incentive, talk about the value. Right? How, right. how are we better if we do this? And it doesn't always have to be. We've talked about this before. It doesn't have to be because I save money. Yeah. It could be because I've boosted the ability of my team to do something that's important. Right. Now, that's what I realized in, in our pitch is we're telling people that we yeah. solve a problem in this way and it has to be implemented a specific way for them. And what I found I, I like to talk about is if I've described the problem and they're on board with that and I've described our solution and they're on board with that, when I get to like deployment performance and scalability, I mean, that just helps it knock it out of the park, right? Because if you're buying into, yeah, I agree with Paul, that's, 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 uh, it makes sense to solve the problem that way. Their like next line of thinking is, well, if I do it that way, like, how am I going to deploy it? Like, is it going to scale? Is it going to perform well? Is already on their minds. Address that right right out of the gate. I mean, we have a slide, right? I have a slide that talks about how easy is it to deploy, what's the performance like, and how does it scale? Yep, and that's, you're addressing that question that I have. It's the, are we ready? Mm-hmm. But, so what, I, what I'm really enjoying about listening to you with this, and, and I very much look forward to us getting some time for you to give me that next, that iteration of your pitch, is I can tell that you've been talking to people because yes. you've got a very good flow, right? You're telling that story, and you're now telling it from a customer's perspective, not from yours. Right, and that's important. Because we, I mean, the the if you're your you're the customer in the beginning, right? So you and if you tell it from that that's angle, um, I I think it resonates. Right? I mean, most of, even if you look at Shark Tank, like let's step out of software and security for a moment. You look at Shark Tank, right? The guy that created the bottle holder. Have you seen that? Dude, this no. thing's awesome. He totally messed up on his pitch because I have a different angle for him. So if you know him or, or you're listening, right? So it's this thing. It like just drapes over your shoulder, and it's this like round ball, but it has a, a, a groove in it, right? Like you got four kids. You're going to know what I'm talking about. It's got a groove mm-hmm. in it, and the bottle goes in there, and it can turn. So you're holding the baby, and you just turn it. Bottle goes in his mouth. Now I got a hand free. And he's like, oh, you can pick up a book and read to your baby. You can, uh, you know, get another bottle or, or whatever. And I'm like, no, dude, you can pick up your drink. Because if yeah, you exactly got kids, right. you need an alcoholic <laughs> beverage, right? <laughs> That's the yeah. problem, dude. <laughs> I mean, don't I mean, read to your kids, obviously, in between <laughs> sipping. <Yeah>. <laughs> but <laughs> your drink is important. <laughs> That's right. Don't, don't I, don't know where, I don't know where I was originally on that, but... Uh, well, something about your, your pitch, and it's important to uh, describe something. I don't know what I was talking about. But well, anyway. yeah, we're going to talk about this as we go through a little bit more here, too, and the importance of listening to people. But what I love is sometimes when you get that chance to explain it, and you've done your best, you, you're as customer-centric as you think you can be, and, and somebody says, so what you're really saying is I can do X and Y at the same time? Right. And that's normally when I say to them, hold on a second, that's awesome. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and so he was the customer, right? Like he had the problem of that we all have when we have kids right. is when you're feeding the baby, both your hands are tied up. You can't change the channel. You can't. Right. I mean, I tried the whole chin thing, you know, yeah. the bottles falling out and everything's just going. It makes a mess. Yeah. It, just, it, it makes a mess. You ever see the picture where the guy's feeding the baby and his wife's pouring the beer in his mouth? That's what I thought of. That would be in my slide deck for the pitch for that product too, <laughs> right? <laughs> I learned how to make it better. No, it's, it's good. So, uh, Chris, I, I love that you asked the question. I hope we gave you some advice. Obviously, um, we respond on Twitter, and uh, you, can, you can follow up with us and take a look at the, the rest of what we're going to lay out. And anybody else who's got a question, hit us up. This is, this is fun. It gives us something to think about. So I, I appreciate that very much. Absolutely. Want to go on the stories there, my friend? I do, because I love... Is this the same guy that did both these first two stories? Yeah, yep. Dude, yep. I, I'm in love with this guy. This guy's awesome. I want to give him a hug. That's how much I love him. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I mean, how do you say his name? Rad? Uh, Rad? 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 Ma- it's R-A-A-D. Mob- Rad? Mo- I don't know. Ra- Ra- it's R-A-A-D. Yeah. He's rad. So he's, Let's call him rad because he is pretty he's, rad. He's rad. Yeah. It's, that's yeah. the way it goes. Rad Mobram. Dude, you're awesome. Um, well, yeah, so he wrote this. He wrote a two parts. Uh, it's on Medium. And we're going to, those are our first two stories. And I, I debated whether we covered them as one or separated them. And they were distinct enough that we separated them. Uh, it's how to build a successful company, part one. Mm. And, um, and, you know, this, his first part echoes exactly what you just said, Paul. 
Don't just start a company. Solve a problem first. Have that problem. I love when he says, when building a business, until you improve the lives of your customers, you can't improve your own. And, and yep. he kind of touches on people like, oh, I want to do a startup because I'm going to make lots of money, right? Like, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do Doesn't that. that like, way. it's good to have goals, yeah. but props for that, right? But in the beginning, it kind of goes back when we're talking about Chris's uh, question, you got to focus on problem and solution first before you start thinking about how much money you're going to make. Like, dude, stay focused. And I really like that uh, in staying focused, like how is this going to improve the lives of my customers? I think is a really good, you know, lesson to take from it. And I, as soon as I read that, I started thinking about my own businesses and making sure I was doing that, right? Like it kind of it forces some reflection, which is why I, I, which is why the article resonated with me, Michael. I, well, and I also think it, I think it plays into a, a same thing and it's a slightly different level. One of my favorite quotes and I learned it as a kid growing up. If you've ever listened to Zig Ziglar or read any of his books, one of the most prolific, impactful, motivational speakers of our time, his favorite quote of mine, hands down, is you can have anything in life you want as long as you help enough other people in life get what they want. Right. And that's, that's right. what this is saying in a slightly different way. But I think that what you've done for the last decade plus is a good example of how this works out in the business world. You've helped a lot of people improve by solving problems, and you gave it away for free. You gave them your mind share. You explained how to do things. You've built up a community. You've been actively podcasting and really helping to shape and advance that and industry. I, I, I didn't always know helps. why that was like why I was doing what I was doing and why that was so valuable, right? I mean, for me in the beginning, I was really like the problem was kind of my own. Like I wanted to share information just because that's what I liked to do, right? Like I liked reading and learning things and, and sharing it, right? Well, I and, find the act of sharing it is what solidifies the knowledge. I mean, I, look, I, yeah. I, I always ask people, if they tell me they like to teach, I always, my, my favorite sorting question is, are you a better teacher or a better learner? Right. So like I, I had that need and then like teacher. I also had a, a business and it was, you know, Ed Scotus who was mentoring me and He's like, dude, like the best marketing and security is to like give something away for free and, and help the community. I'm like, well, I already have the need and the desire to do that. So I'm like, let's just marry the two, right? Like I've, I've got a business that I kind of selfishly want to promote, but I love learning and giving back. So why don't I go do that? And I love tip number two here, like find a problem that affects people on a daily or weekly basis. And what I didn't realize at the time was that security pre professionals primarily in this example, have this need that like every day you want to go learn something. You want to go read something. You want to keep up with what's going on and you want to do that every day. But our lives and our jobs are, you know, you can get hectic and, and how do you do that? So where do you make time? Like it turned out just by accident at that time in 2005 and I was solving that problem. I didn't know I was solving that problem. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool that it worked out that way that on their way to work, right, they can listen to a show. And you know, that's be getting fun your sometime. daily problem solved uh, on Security Weekly. It, it, it'd be great uh, on a time when uh, when you and Paul, or I'm sorry, when you and Larry and Jack are there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have this discussion as a segment. Mm. Looking back over the last decade, what are some of the lessons you've learned? What are some right. of the pivots that you've had? Not just the new studio and the upgrade and the gear and those things. Those are good discussions too. But yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because because you've done that. And so all I wanted to point out to anybody looking at this is that. You know, when you find that problem because you felt it, that's great. Mm -hmm. If, but you know, if if I were to use different language, when you find a problem that a lot of people have that they're aware of, that they're willing to pay for, is that's yes. that's the key. But that that's aware of. I mean, and that's the one thing that that's I don't hard. It's, necessarily I know. see in this this. But mm -hmm. was a real interesting thing for me over the last decade or so. I've stumbled on things that I can see really clearly and nobody else can. And despite me explaining it, mm. they're like, oh, yeah, I see that now. Yeah, I don't really care. I'd like to do X, right. Y, and Z first. I mean, because like, they're like, oh. they may have that problem and they not be aware of it and they're not going to be motivated to solve it. I, no I see that in security yeah. a lot in the, yeah. the toughest cells in security with all the companies that I've, I've worked with and worked for over the years. Like the hardest things are like, well, you know, people should be thinking about this problem this way and solving it in this way and it's not generally accepted have a tough time now i'm not no, saying I, I think that, you're right i'm not saying that that's always failure a lot of times that does lead to success because they're like people are going to latch on to this idea and sometimes they do sometimes they don't but when they do 
And now you're first to market because <laughs> you were, whether you knew it or not, were forward thinking, like those companies do really well. Apple's an example of this. Mm -hmm. When you look at what Steve Jobs did when he came back to Apple and a lot of the decisions he made with the initial iPods and Sims, people looked at it and said, no, wait, okay, I didn't realize I, I needed that, right? Now he's yeah. unnatural in his ability to do that. The other thing I would That's say here- That's a small here, percentage and I, I have to say that the iPad is probably the most prolific example of solving a problem that people weren't aware of, probably in the history of technology. Yeah. Like, and in the so beginning, far. I remember, I was like, what the, what the hell do I need a tablet for? Like, I got a, got a phone and I got a computer. What do I need? A, now, now look how the tables have turned. I mean, that is the most yeah. prolific example of that. That's a, a shining example of success. Um, you know, not so much when we talk about the Apple Newton. So there were failures there too. So don't be, yeah, failure no, is fine. a road to success. I mean, there's lots of quotes well, about and, that. You know, right? and, but, and that's, that's a great way to introduce, like, you know, we'll use that as a segue too. But, but what I looked at too was when you're finding that problem, just because you think you've figured it out, that at least in my own experience in the last year or so, as you're explaining it to people, it's really pay attention to what they say. You know, a lot of times we talk to somebody that pause is really a chance for us to think about the next brilliant thing we're going to say. If you can condition yourself to just listen to what the other person says, I find you get a lot. And I'll tell you, I had a buddy uh, try something. His name is Roger Corville. Roger is, is, is brilliant, especially at virtual presentation and stuff. Mm -hmm. Called me up. He's got a new business idea. And he runs it by me. And we're excited, right? We're talking. It's all fantastic. This is, this is really good. And, and then he, he sent me a note about an hour later. And he said, hey, brother, do me a favor. One sentence. What stayed with you based mm. on everything we just oh, talked like about? That. What it's like? Give me one sentence. Oh, I'm, I'm going to steal that and I'm going to figure out other ways to ask it. And, uh, and I'm going to start doing that around straight talk. Mm. But I'll tell you, I've been doing it anecdotally over the last two weeks, Paul. It's insane how people will describe the problem to you. And in, in your mind, you say, but isn't that what I just said? If you can gut check that, mm -hmm. write down what they said. You're like, you know what? It's 80% in common, mm -hmm. but their words, all right, let me try their words. You try their words, somebody goes, oh, I have that problem. You're like, okay, I, yeah. I, I should yeah. listen to more people. Yeah. So I, you, learn, I think, you learn by talking to people uh, the, how you solve the problem that you would never realize, right? I mean, they talk about different aspects. They may talk about completely different problems that you solve that you've never, we see that on Shark Tank a lot too, right? The, the sharks will be like, yeah, that solves that problem. But if you used it to solve this problem, like that would be really awesome. That, that's exactly right. And, you know, and I think as we segue then into this, so this guy, Rad, continues with the, the second part to it. I love and the gist this. of it is basically get out and talk to people. But I want to point something else out in the, in the mix here that, again, I, don't, I, I think is kind of subtle. But, Paul, I just picked it up listening to you. When you go talk to these people, do recognize that they are smart people. If they're, if, yes. First of all, if they're willing to spend money with you, you know they're smart people. Mm -hmm. But, but Stark aside, listen to what they have to say because I've had a number of folks say to me, wow, I really like how you're doing X, but you realize this would work for Y too. And I usually just say, yep, or I didn't realize. Hold on, tell me more. And they're happy to. Right. They're happy to pay you to help solve their problem, but they want you to be successful. And they're happy to tell you what else is out there. And you can't do that if you wait. You know, I, I've, um, I was going to do some of this in my update later, but I've got a blog post. I started it on like Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll get done today. But, it, but the general working title of it is, you know, you can't learn until you actually launch. When I announced everything last week and I got running with it, I have had, I don't know, a dozen, 15 conversations since then. They've been brilliant. Some mm -hmm. really like that emotional roller coaster we talk about. Oh, yeah. But Paul, talking to people... Oh, it's, it's freaking outstanding. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like there are some startups, uh, Michael, that, you know, they're, they're set down a path. And even though people might be trying to adjust it, like they stick to their guns. I don't want to say that that's unsuccessful all the time, because I think there are cases where that can be successful. I think the majority, you need to be very fluid in, in willing to change directions at any moment when you have a startup, right? But I don't want to discount that the Steve Jobs of the world, right? They're just picking a direction and going with it no matter what. Um, but for a lot of startups, I think it's important that when you hear feedback that you're able to adjust because you're still small and you can do that. Like once you reach 50 million, 
hard to change directions, right? So picking the right direction in the beginning is all that more important because you're going to, if you are successful at 50 million in revenue, I think is, is successful in my, in my mind, uh, maybe, maybe not, but, um, that it's I think, a, I, think a mil- I think a million in revenue is successful. Yeah. Although maybe not I, harder. Yeah, to I don't know. I don't really, I don't know. This is a philosophical thing for me. You know, is, is your revenue number a measure of your success? I mean, it is one measurement. I don't think, I wouldn't determine like success or failure based on your revenue number, right? I'm so excited to hear you say that because I agree, especially for people who do this as more of a lifestyle mm-hmm. or, or they want to escape that nine to five. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's, that's one of those things I think is interesting. So as, as Rad moves into the second part, he's basically saying, okay, get out there and talk to people. And, and when you do it, what you really have to understand is, is it worth solving i have to tell you this one this one hit home for me more this than not awesome i I've love got a of his I example is this based on a true story yeah. because the way he tells it is just it, it sounds well, like it was a true story oh no yeah no i'm sure it is because it, sometimes you can't make this type of stuff up <laughs> and, and what's interesting is any and here this right is here, so some of my friends too as well <laughs> and as he explains as this guy's telling him about an idea he's not asking about the problem and I have to tell you, that's what happens to a lot of us. We yep. get so excited with the idea that we forget to stop and ask those questions. I love this. His friend James is like, yeah, I got this idea. It's an app which allows me to watch a movie with any of my friends from around the world. In addition, I can chat with them while watching the movie in real time. Like, I can see my friends, like, you know, like excited about something like this, right? And, um, and he's like, you know, the, I, I moved away and I miss watching movies with my roommates and it's a really big problem. And I told all my friends about it and they all loved it. Right. And I think that's something that we need to hit on, Michael, um, you know, security being very much of a community. When you run ideas by your friends, like they're your friends. Right. Like they're going to be encouraging um, and not always think about it uh, as being on the... Well, maybe in security that isn't a problem. Maybe we're such critical thinkers that in security, this isn't a problem. Your friends are going to tell nope, you problem. if your idea sucks. <laughs> no, I can't. Well, no, they're, they're happy no. to tell you all the... I'll, t- I'll tell you the interesting things I've learned in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's no shortage of people happy to point out what you've done wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I've learned to embrace that. That's actually... I'm not saying that I want more of it. I'm not saying, please kick me. What I'm saying is I, I value that now differently. I, I see the importance of that, and that's really useful to me. But the second part to it is, no, there's still a number of uh, – we're humans, and the people that we're engaging with and we're talking to are humans. And if they're friends, you do have those friends that, that will keep it real with you, but you right. still have a number that go, oh, I really like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I could totally use that. Yeah. But the day you come to them and say, hey, I just launched, and um, you know, I'd love you to be the first customer – Oh, it's great, but let me tell you the reasons I can't be your customer now. Right, right. You know, so it's yeah. Oh, when you ask people, when you that. ask people to pay for something, I, I think it's it's different. And sometimes when, when you have those friendships, it's awkward. I mean, look, mm. I know for me, it's awkward to ask friends to do stuff. Yeah. I, I kind of prefer not to. But I love how uh, Rad picks apart the problem, um, picks apart this idea, I should say. And he's like, you know, how often do people talk to one another while you're watching a movie? So that kind of throws this chat idea right out the window. And then how much does the average person coordinate with friends to watch a movie? Um, probably not. Most people like 25 and over watch movies with their significant others and not really their friends. And would your friends stay dedicated enough to coordinate watching a session on a monthly basis? Like probably like the reason you probably watch movies with your roommates is because you were all in the same room, right? Not because Splitting you had a pizza, uh, drinking some beer. Exactly. There. Exactly. So, well, and so this is the thing I think is interesting, right? So the second issue is he says he asked his friends. He should have asked a range of people that do not know him. And that's what you and I were just talking about. I remember a number of years ago, I was at a speaker lab. It was uh, on humor. And uh, look, I'll admit my naivete. One of the guys that was there had had his own HBO special. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting down with him and I said, so when, when you do these, I mean, are you coming up with all those jokes on the fly? Okay, I get it, right? I just admit I was naive. He was gracious. He didn't laugh at me. He mm-hmm. reached into his, the breast pocket of his jacket, pulled out a book, and he said, here's, here's the jokes. Some of these jokes I've been working on for 25 years. Mm-hmm. So again, I naively said, can I see it? He's like, no, this is, no. <laughs> it goes with me everywhere. This is mine. I write down observations. I said, all right, well, tell me how it works. And he said, I make observations. I see something that's kind of funny to me. I write it down. I think about it. If it's still funny to me, I, I try it out with my family and friends. I mm-hmm. go, and he goes, that's completely useless because frankly, 
they're not a judge anymore. Yeah. And so what I'll do is I'll try these little bits out on other people and I'll see where they work. Mm -hmm. That was a big lesson for me. The, the joke's not funny if, unless it's funny to people you don't know. Right. Your product's not going to work until people you don't know say, okay, I like it. But there's another part to this too. It doesn't mean every time you talk to somebody, you have to do some big, long pitch. Oh, you got 20 minutes? You can just ask them about the problem. Mm -hmm. Or you hear them mention it and you go, you know, that's interesting. I've been working on that too. What's it like for you? Trust me, if it's a problem for them, they're happy to talk to you about it. But then yeah. write it down. I thought another interesting uh, piece of advice in this article, uh, skip it down to step five, is find out if other people are searching for this kind of product or talking about this problem online. And he mentions like a Google keyword planner and, and some tools that will actually help you with that. I thought it was pretty cool. I never thought yeah. about that. It, and I, I've looked at that, and it's it's funny because all right. So when you try it, let me know how much time you spend doing it <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like well, let me try this combo. Let me oh, that's interesting. Wait, they're not searching for that. Why? What are they? Yeah, I think it's useful. I think it can be distracting until you get that that a little bit more narrowed focus. In mm -hmm. fact, reading this, I went oh, I should probably go look at this now again. That's that's interesting. And I'll tell you, even today, I've picked up some better phrasing from people I've talked to. Uh, that have joined the program, they want to be in it. Kicks off next week. They're excited about it. I'm excited about it, mm -hmm. and um, and wow, I'm a lot smarter already. So it's cool. It's a, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, no, this this is good. And um, he did offer a part three. And um, to be fair, I didn't find it yet. So I'm gonna have to go look for it. See if he if he put that up or not. It was pretty good. But I'll, I'll tell you, the next one I really liked. Now this is a Harvard Business Review one, and it's a. Uh, I can never say Ron's name right. Ron Ash Kenas or something. Um, don't, I guess, don't ask me. I like his stuff. I, I, I've, I've enjoyed it um, over the last couple of years, reading the things that he puts out there. So here's what he says. The go-to-market approach that startups need to adopt. And, and there's some counterculture in it, but he also has some stats. I thought these were good stats. So it starts out, uh, it's estimated 100,000 technology startups reach the basic funding stage every year. Fewer than 10%, about 4,000 of those, are able to show enough promise to actually receive a first round of capital from venture or private equity sources. So if we go back to how we open the show, that means that they've identified a problem mm -hmm. and they've explained it well enough that somebody says, yep, let me give you some money. Yeah, you've gone from idea to execution and you've done a nice job. Now, what it talks about then is your go-to-market approach and it had – a warning here for technologists that, it, I don't know, it sure resonated with me. I'm guessing it, it might have with you. Uh, it said, um, first of all, that the technologists tend to wait on this because, well, because it's not in our nature and we get nervous about it. Mm -hmm. And it, it points out that your go-to-market approach is what's going to separate your success and sustainable from the companies that tend to fade away. But that instead of thinking about what you did, you've got to think about what the customers are trying to achieve what problem they need to solve, and how your product helps them to be successful. Yeah, I'm realizing that your go-to-market strategy and being able to execute on it is such a large portion of your success. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, you can have a go-to-market strategy that works for you and consider yourself successful. If you want to really grow, get big, take lots of funding, get lots of customers. You, maybe you're happy making a product where you've got you know, a couple hundred customers and you know, that's my thing. Like That's cool, right? But if you're looking to grow and expand um, and, and reach a global audience, your go-to-market strategy is, is like everything, I'm realizing. Yeah, it, well, so it's almost like it's right up there with like the problem you solve and how you're trying to solve it. If you don't have, you could have the best solution in the world. If you couple that with the wrong go to market strategy, you could fail. I mean, it's really about like packaging price in software, packaging, pricing, licensing. Uh, that is really everything. Everything. In right. Software. So, so I've got initial thought on that, but I want to point this out because this is when I got really excited. So, uh, so Ron and his co-author lay out some questions, right? And it's stuff that, that we've asked and a lot of us ask. Should we put together a direct sales force or do we sell indirectly? Mm -hmm. Should we organize by market or by industry or by geography or how are we going to do it? How do we do technical support? What are we going to bundle into it? How are we going to set up our pricing? What's all that? Take a look on. And, and then this is the line that I loved. The problem is that these are fundamentally the wrong questions to begin with. 
They focus on the perspective of the startup and the technology, but it's not the customer's perspective. And I went, oh, yeah. How does the customer want to buy it? Yeah. Mm. And sometimes, and I love this, figuring out how do you go to market is not a one-time exercise. It's an ongoing process, constantly informed by a deeper and deeper understanding of customer needs and how your product can meet them. That is absolutely important. This is it. This one's really hitting home with me because like, this is where we're at now, right? We're putting the idea in front of customers and getting feedback and figuring out how we want to go to market based on that, on that feedback, right? And we're trying things and some things aren't working and some things are, but eventually we'll get it right. And I hope so. <laughs> no, I, well, and so this is, I mean, look, I, I can tell you right now for me, I, I, I've learned a lot since I've, I really clamped down and focused on this uh, almost a year ago, a little less. And I've already seen the iteration and I've figured out from it every time and I've really liked it. One of the things that they lay out here is you really want to get into this consultative selling approach. Now, if you're listening to this, don't roll your eyes, especially if you've been in technology Mm -hmm. because we see that there's all sorts of different styles. But what it basically means is it's a mindset and it says, I'm going to work with you, the customer, and I'm going to consult with you on your best interests which may not be me, which may not be me now, right? And this, this fits into a lot of different things that we talk about, we're going to continue to talk about. But what I like about it is it says, if you need to figure out how this is going to work, go get your number of folks, go get a small group of folks, and just help them, help, help them figure out how to help them, help them figure out how to solve their problem, help them figure out how to navigate. Look, I'll tell you, if you're selling to technology people, most technology people do not understand their procurement processes. And that slows down a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And, and they're not sure who needs to approve on it, how to explain stuff to them. If you can get involved early, and you got to have a sample size. For me, I, I pick five. I find that if you can do something with five people, at least in the security space, and you get enough trend and enough insight to say, yep, okay, I'm figuring it out, you're good. By the way, if you get to the end of the five and you go, well, that was five different ways of doing it, find five more. But it's, it's working through that. And this is where I think, Paul, you, you and John both, you, you got backgrounds as trainers and educators. Mm-hmm. You've been doing the podcasting stuff. You know how to explain things. Are you finding that people in our industry are open to this? Are you offering them your knowledge and insight to help solve some of these problems? And is that helping you understand how to approach it better? Yeah, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job with that. And... Um I think we've got a better understanding of how we solve the problem and why that's important. Um, I think we've got some pretty good positioning right now, which is something we really haven't talked about is how you position yourself uh, in the market. Um, and I think that's, that's an important part of uh, your go-to-market strategy, right? Um, is where you fit. And I, I think we're, we're, we're just recently getting there. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you and, and our listeners, right? I mean, Our problem right now, I think, is, you know, we're all lined up on the cliff getting ready to jump in the water and no one wants to be the first one. I think we're suffering from some of that. You need a push? Yeah. So, you know, I need need someone to give someone else a push, right? I mean, um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, budget and the available options that are out there today. I think people are um, skeptical, especially in the security market. Even if you have a, a, a relationship of any kind with them, I think they're still skeptical, uh, especially in security, because there's so many new vendors all the time. I'm finding the exact same thing in, in me, and, and what I'm selling them is the ability to go solve some of these problems. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, um, it has been eye-opening for me, and it's, believe it or not, helping me figure out not only some better approaches, but maybe some intermediate products and training to help people um, through some of these things. There might even be some opportunities for us to continue to collaborate on that. Mm-hmm. But, but what I think is interesting in this, when you talk about that, is sometimes you need that push. You need to figure it out. One of the things that I, I like about what we're able to do on this program is we look at the, the mentality. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm posting up for some new leadership summits uh, for 2017 already we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And one of the themes is looking at bringing some of that entrepreneurial mindset and spirit into it. Mm -hmm. And we're pulling in people that do startups and that do security startups to look at some of these types of things. This is absolutely useful if you're a leader in your security organization. So that's why when we say we're looking at the business of security, but also the security of business, 
and how that works. The startup lens is a great opportunity for that. A lot of folks that you're talking to then are going to say, wow, sounds good, but I don't have budget for that. Remember, if you're in an enterprise today, budget and funding are not the same. You may not have budget, but that's entirely arbitrary. Somebody else has funding or the organization has funding, unless the whole organization is going through a town turn. If then you can position yourself as helping them solve a high priority problem for a funding stream that they have to get a result that they want, you can help them make that case. But if you're listening and you're in that situation and you're going, how, how, how? First of all, reach out to us. Uh, you can hit us up uh, on Twitter and other places, and, and we can do it here. Security, we, we can talk about that more. But the operative thing is somebody has funding, and if you can solve this problem, right? Go back to our article. Mm -hmm. If you can help somebody else solve the problem they have, they're going to help you solve it. There's usually funding available, and um, maybe, Paul, we can look at some ways to help people tri free up some funding to be able to work with you guys. Yeah, and well, and I think... Uh, that's an excellent point, Michael. Um, don't get me wrong. I also am thinking about it in terms of like my segue and more retail products, right? And you may look at something and go, wow, that's really cool. And like I recognize that, that brand, but nah, I don't know if I want to be one of the first ones to ride the new, you know, the new Segway. But you go to your friend's house, right? He's tooling around on his Segway, freaking having a great time. That's that social proof. Yeah. And you're like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a Segway. And even you know, better if I, if I can get a deal on it. Oh, then I'm definitely like, then you've just like closed the deal, right? And now yeah. that's another person that's going to be riding around their Segway and their friends are going to come over and be like, oh, I got I to gotta get on this bandwagon too. And like, I wasn't going to buy one, but since now I know like two people that bought one and have positive experiences, I'm going to buy one too. As a startup, I think that's one of the challenges that I'm, I'm seeing right now is you don't have that momentum, right? Right, no, it's hard to build it. But here's mm -hmm. the thing I'll tell you, at least for myself, I, I had two or three people in the last two weeks say, hey, uh, would you like a video testimonial? Or I'm going to go through this and you can use me as a case study. Right. That's invaluable. It's hard sometimes to ask for it. I'm getting more comfortable asking for it. Mm -hmm. These cases, I didn't even ask for it. They said, look, I know what you're, what you're trying to do. I know it's right. hard to get started. So again, if you're listening right now and you're on that, that buyer side, that consumer side of this, and you're looking at going, I think there's a good opportunity there. I can tell you if you reach out and you work with somebody, whether it's us or, or something else that you see, ask them how it's going. Ask them how their stories are. Ask them if that would be valuable to them. And, you know, maybe they'll knock something off. Maybe they'll throw something extra into it. But you know what? I can tell you right now, just the process of learning how all that works and working together on it, mm -hmm. you, you get a lot better off. It, it's exciting how that, that comes out. So it, it wouldn't be a show. Let's talk about uh, connected devices, the otherwise called Internet of Things. So a story, what's interesting, this is in the EE Times, and it said the consumers aren't excited about connected appliances. And so the idea is people like it, but, no, oh, no, no, security, not going to do it, privacy. And um, to me, I, well, let me ask you your take. I, I feel like we blame a lot of stuff on security. I'd love to do that. Oh, but security. Oh, that sounds great. Oh, security. Mm. So is this a canard or do we, is security a real focus here? What do you think? No, I, I think that security has become uh, one of the barriers to entry for a lot of IoT device. I don't think it's the only one. I don't think it's as big as this uh, survey makes it out to be. But I certainly uh, think that the general public knows that there's bad people out there that do bad things with the internet and software. And so yeah, but when I, you present well, something like, I'm going to put a camera in my house or a door lock or a car is going to be connected to the internet, I think for some people that definitely plays into their mind. Certainly in the security community, we're very skeptical. Um, I think uh, the confidence that people have in technology is kind of related to that. Like, oh, I, I have my computer on my phone and yet crashes sometimes. Like, do I want my refrigerator crashing? <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. Um, oh, you know, I'd it, love to see a follow up on on if if that's what people are looking at right. to a certain extent. Reli reliability, I, I I think is 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 huge, and also I think that it also from our previous conversation on the show, Michael, like, um, just uh, does it really solve a problem? Like, yeah, when I'm at the supermarket, I I can't see inside my refrigerator, like. That's right. not. I, that, I mean, yeah, that's, to some you know people that might right be now. a problem, but for most people, they're like, 
yeah, I've gone along this long going to the supermarket like my whole life because when I was a young kid, I used to go to the supermarket with my mom and she didn't have a camera that looked inside of our refrigerator. Like she made she a list before we went. She have a digital list on her phone. She right, probably exactly. had to make an actual list. Yeah, and when we needed to like write notes to each other, we just wrote them on paper and stuck them to the refrigerator. We didn't have a tablet on the front of That's our... That's useful. Look at you go. Yeah, but, but now, I mean, Samsung is saying they solve a problem. Right, I I don't think it's one that resonates, and I think a lot of IoT devices are starting to fall. Like Ring is a prime example, and it was one that until I tested the product, like I didn't know that I had that problem of seeing who was at my door. Right, and so I think the IoT companies definitely have this this issue. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this: I know one of the things that we talked about recently, looking at IoT, was like sensors of sensors. So the IoT becomes a sensor either of the device that we have or of other sensors, and they give us ample warning, ample knowledge, and they help craft a better experience overall. I think that works. Now, oddly, that's probably the argument for, let me tell you, when your milk is running low or you need to replenish your coffee or what have you. But, you know, just yesterday we had our air conditioning go down, and when the repair guy was here, um, it's one of those systems like, you know, he pulls up all the error codes, figures something out, Mm -hmm. uh, was able to go replace the fuse, reset it, we're back at it. And he's the one who made the comment to me about how, you know, the, I think he said he started by saying, you know, these systems basically diagnose themselves. Mm. And I said, is that good or bad? He goes, no, it makes my job a lot easier. Mm-hmm. And I said, so what do you think of all these new devices coming out with even more sensors and stuff? He said, it's going to be a learning curve. He said mm-hmm. that we're going to get some stuff right, we're going to get some stuff wrong, but I think when it sorts out, it's going to be better for everybody. Now, when okay. we when you say connected devices, devices that now connect to each other. I think is both exciting and kind of scary. If you watch Mr. Robot, mm. shining example on that show on how that shit can go horribly wrong. And I think the segment in that show will probably set back uh, home automation and IoT uh, at least a year. If you just watch that that one episode. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the episode I'm referring to. I haven't. Right? I'm a whole yeah. season behind on that. Um, yeah. and the there, there is one that, that definitely picks on the problems. However... It can have interesting privacy implications as well as maybe convenience or, or maybe just like weird stuff. Like when my nephew comes to the door and rings my doorbell, it's connected to my refrigerator. It locks my refrigerator because he loves to eat all the food in my fridge, right? Like, that's, I don't so know. It's so but it's that's, that's kind of scary. Like, are we going to know, like, because I have my Fitbit and it talks to everything, like when I walk into my house, how long it takes me before I open my fridge? And I, that that just has interesting. The refrigerator one uh, I've researched, and some of the privacy concerns around if you can uh, inventory what's in the fridge, and that's digital, and electronic, and connected to the internet, and connected to other things. That means attackers can get at it, and if they can see what you're eating, they can pick out your dietary restrictions and potentially make an assumption about what health issues that you're having, and then that information could become public. I mean, that's a well, stretch, that's a, but that's the example well, that I've seen what, in privacy. Well, you know what, though? Things that start as a stretch become real pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we, we actually know for a fact <clears throat> that um, retina scans and iris scans that you see being pushed more and more often, mm-hmm. they reveal pregnancy sooner than you know. Yep. They reveal um, certain um, dietary deficiencies and certain health conditions faster than you tend to realize it. So no, I, I think that there's some some well, real stuff. And not there just that too. So what if crack. now what if the refrigerator manufacturer decides they're gonna make that information available to your health insurance provider that's gonna base your rates on what you're eating? It's the same thing with a car. Is exactly. your car insurance that can monitor through the, the uh, uh, OBD2 port and it sends it to them? Like they're going to adjust your rates based on how fast you drive or how cautious or not so cautious you drive. I think that's the concern that maybe got lumped into security in this article, but it's more about privacy than it is security that is actually kind of scary for some of these. Well, and so let's, and let's bring it back to you. So if you're watching and you've been in security, this isn't going to be new. If you're not in security, one of the things that we have that I still like is what we call the basic triad, right? Availability, confidentiality, confidentiality and integrity. Or uh, if you do it overseas, you tend to go AIC, right, instead of CIA, because mm-hmm. that yeah. sets people off. I've watched people for years decide whether we like it or not, or it needs to be more complex or not. Here's why I like it. You can break almost every conversation down. And the thing that keeps going through my mind talking about this is 
Surprisingly, I'm less concerned with what we're talking about with confidentiality and availability. It's integrity to me is everything. Yeah. Because what happens what if then an if attacker somebody breaks, modifies that? Breaks into your fridge, shows that you've been eating, you know, cheeseburgers and, and stuff that's really bad for you and going through 18 bottles of soda during a day. And now and, your insurance yes, rates get automatically cool. adjusted. But now, and keep and people go, oh, well, that's simple. No. Okay, then go deal with your insurance company right. and try to show them what the accurate data is. Right. And, and what the real outcome or the result is. And I, so I, I think, I think, so here's, here's my take on it, right? So these surveys are what I call perception surveys. Well, it's what they're, they're called perception surveys. It's not what I call them. And this, there's something to keep in mind with the perception survey. When you see them, you should go say, cool, what were the questions that were asked? And then I'm always curious, were they asked by an actual person or, uh, or were they asked not by a person? Because what happens with the perception survey is how you ask the question definitely flavors how somebody answers it. But then if it's a real person, you tend to get a different answer than if it's completely anonymous or the person feels as if it's anonymous. Because sometimes the way we want to answer the questions, right, project a better version of us. It, it's not suggesting that we're lying. It's like when you're dealing with little kids that don't really com comprehend lying, you could say, are you lying to me? Which I, I, is not recommended by most people. But you can say, and did you tell me the way that it happened? or the way that you wish that it had happened, or what you would have liked to have done. And what happened, I mean, we see some breaches all the time, right? Oh, the, the consumers say if this, this retail is breached, they're never going to go back there again. But we have the evidence from their credit card statements that they absolutely go back there again and continue to spend as much, if not more, than they did before. So, you know, the way I look at it then is to go, to, so does this mean that if you're working on an IoT today, if you don't get security right, you're screwed? No. 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 Does it mean security is going to be important? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And it means people are warming up to it. Now, what, what else went through my head, Paul? Give me your take on this because we've talked about this mm -hmm. a lot. So, so consumers that are now worried about privacy and security related to interconnected devices and Internet of Things, but they're still going to go buy the, the cheap wireless routers with the chipsets from a decade ago that you've proven six ways from Sunday aren't secure. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, that's just a failure to educate them on the threat model. Right. They with some of these devices, they can recognize and do the threat modeling on their own. Right. They can say, that's a great point. Someone's going like to hack that. into my fridge and it might cause bad things for me when they go by a wireless router. They're not thinking, oh, you know, someone's going to get into my wireless router and use a DNS pinning attack and steal my bank credentials. Like they're just not thinking that way. Right. So, Fair enough. yeah, that's that's a good point. All right. So here's what it comes down to, though. I think that you do need to pay attention to security. So if you're looking at these connected devices, you're, you're seeing an opportunity, and you follow the rest of our advices. You've gone, you've talked, you've figured out where the problem is. Please consider security. And if you're listening and you're not in security, you can reach out to us. We'll connect you to somebody. I, I know I'm, I'm full up. Paul's full up. Happy to chat with you, though. Ha happy to listen to your idea under NDA or otherwise and connect you to somebody in our industry who is competent and credible and willing to work with you. Because what I'm fairly certain of is those of you who figure out how to explain this better and translate your solution into an experience that also protects people's security and privacy, you will be the winners if you can move faster. Uh, in our final article, Michael, I love the picture. I knew you would. I oh, my this. God. I was, I was actually laughing out loud uh, <laughs> to the pic because I remember watching the episodes. Uh, they come from Silicon Valley. <laughs> and this is how um, uh, mistakes that will, uh, or what's the title of the article? Nine reasons your VC pitch will fail. And they include pictures uh, from Silicon Valley. And yeah. the one that's just, why are you dressed like Steve Jobs? Am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Just, it's, it's look, I, I don't like negative stuff, right? I, I, I try not to be the, here's why you suck. Here's why it's going to fail. That said, Paul, I knew you loved the pictures, <laughs> um, but I thought the advice was pretty good. Let me yeah. point out a couple. It's got nine reasons. I, I got four that I really like. The first one, the first mistake that points out is it basically says you um, you didn't research the VCs you're pitching. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's any presentation you give. Um, understand your audience. That out. It's it's yes. fast. Right. And yet, like we have to keep saying it because. because yeah. Hey, no, no, no. I, I've been presenting for a while now, and I still make that mistake of not understanding the audience. And I'm really down on myself when I make it because I should know better by now, but it's an easy mistake to make. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I think there's some ways that, that we can combat that by asking it. Um, mistake number two is uh, not customizing your pitch. I've written about this. I call it the perfect message fallacy. Here's why. We get so excited 
And we spent so much time on it that we go, no, this, this will work for everybody. They'll, they'll make it. All right? So they talk about spraying and praying and everything mm-hmm. else. Well, yeah, what happens is we put so much time and effort into it that we really feel confident that this will be something for everybody. Mm-hmm. The answer is it ends up being noise in the background that nobody pays any attention to right. it. So, uh, and by the way, since we keep going back to Shark Tank, you'll see this. The people who come on Shark Tank and say, hey, Mr. Wonderful, I got this for you. Or I know, yeah. Mr. Wonderful, you're going to ask me about this. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Mark, you're going to ask about this. Here, those are the answers. And what, are the, what do they typically do? If the person got it right, they go, oh, all right, you're paying attention. Right, yes. right. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, the other two that stuck out to me, number four, is getting defensive. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it's um, so what they say is don't don't if, if they disagree with you. And we've seen this again, Shark Tank. I've seen this a lot of places. Somebody's pitching, and you go, "Yeah, I don't agree." Well, what do you mean you don't agree? Of course, I, I, I and you get right. all really fired said, up. People don't realize which side of the table that they're standing yeah. or sitting on. You're asking <laughs> like, for money. You're, you're pitching. You're not on the side of the table that you're investing. So listen to what those people have to say. Yeah. Uh, now, I think there's a, there's a silver lining to this. If you can learn to suppress that ego long enough, mm-hmm. and, and I don't mean that any pejorative way. I get it. Yeah. You've yeah, put no. your heart and soul right. into this. Right. Yes. You're excited about it, and somebody's basically telling you your baby's ugly. Yes. And since they have no interest in finding a tactful way of saying it, they're flat out telling you mm-hmm. your baby's ugly. Now, what I've learned is there's two things. That doesn't mean they're not interested. Sometimes they just want to see how you react. To yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, totally. The other thing is, sometimes they're right. Your baby is ugly, but that's just because your baby didn't grow up yet. There's some ugly kids that they grow up to be real, real and beautiful. It, it, and sometimes it's confusing them. as to what the right, like, what's the right response to that. If, and I think it depends on the question. Like sometimes I feel like the investors will ask the question, and in hoping that you'll kind of challenge them on it, right? Yeah. Like they'll purposely do that. They like, like, kind of throw out a bad idea and see if you'll you'll bait it, right? But, you know, other times it, it can go the other way, too. If they're like, well, I think you should do it this way. And they're like, yeah, I'm totally open to suggestions. And they're like, nope, you're not a leader. You're not, you're not owning it in your field. You need too much guidance. You don't know what you're doing. So it can, it's a double-edged sword, dude. It can go either yeah, way. Yeah, it, it's what I call sorting questions, right? Sometimes the reason they're going to pitch they're going to pitch something back at you or push back is, is they're really trying to assess who you are. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean you need to stick to your guns? And that's, to your point, it, th- there's a nuance to this and there's a practice to it. And, you know, a lot of times there isn't a right way to handle it. It's right. just Well, I think stupid, you get yourself in trouble if they notes. suggest something and you're like, right away, you're like, yeah, I'd be open to that. That, I believe, is a mistake. And I'd like your feedback on this, Michael. If an investor would say something like to me and if I thought it was a good idea, I think it's super important to say why. And, and that's as I get I, feedback from people. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'd be open to that because... Everything that I've experienced in my direction, I think that makes sense, and here's why. And if, but if you just say, "Yeah, I'm open to that. I'm open to that. Let's do it," you know. I'll I'll tell bad. you when when those things have happened to me, or where I get a customer who says, "Hey, I really like X. Could you do Y?" Mm-hmm. Instead of going, "Absolutely, love that." What mm-hmm. I usually say is, "That's amazing." They go, "Why?" And I go, "I actually was just looking at the same thing because I realized, right? But it's right. the same thing. It's, you it's why I realized why A, B, and C." And that really kind of works out. But, but then we hit it all the time. The answer is why not? Well, let me just, if you think the answer is why not, you're okay to say, I've looked at that and it didn't make sense to yes, me. We I'll do tell you all what, time. maybe you see something I don't. Is that, it's, are you asking because it's important to you or were you asking to just see how I reacted to it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, by the way, if you ask that, you got to have a, a you got to have a pretty good, uh, either, uh, ability with those types of things but there's times I'll, I'll tell you people will put stuff to me and i really don't know why they're asking and i actually just say depends why are right. you asking right now that well, could be the wrong answer in some situations but yeah uh, and people ask when, when we, we talk about logs right and i in during the presentation i go into uh, varying levels of detail about like why not logs and, and i don't and i try not to completely bash solutions like Here's why logs have their place. Mm-hmm. Here's why uh, I think they li- where they leave some gaps, and here's how our solution is structured around that. But then I kind of leave some things sometimes in my back pocket if they bring up logs again. Like, oh, if you could just do this with logs. And I'm like, look, we don't do that because like we looked into it, and here are the problems that we saw, and here's why it wouldn't work out. And if this condition changed, yes, we could support logs. Uh, See, and what me, I love about that uh, is, no, but here's what's great what about we that. we fell into, but... 
you're tailoring your pitch and you and you realize I don't have to tell you everything. I'm going to give you the flavor to it. We're going to go down. Oh, you keep coming back to it? Okay. I'm going to have to either disabuse you of this at some point mm-hmm. or there's no love connection here. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Yeah. Like, if, dude, if you love logs and logs is your thing, then that's fine. Have but fun. I'm, and you're not going to convince them otherwise. No. no so that's okay. Here, here's the last one. And I, I kind of want to make a point on this, and I, I know that you may not be happy with my point. But what it talks about, their, their fifth reason is because you're boring. And, and what I'm going to point out is I think a lot of people, frankly, are boring. We're, we're taught absolutely stupid ways to present, which is, you know, everybody should be NPR. But by the way, NPR isn't necessarily boring. Mm-hmm. But th- there's, there's an ability here, and we get amped up on the features, and so we want to go into the features, which, frankly, are boring for people. They want to talk about their problems and their solutions and the better them and how all that works. But then what this says is, so here's what you need to do. You need to be funny and you need to capture their attention and you should build a theme around Silicon Valley. My advice? Please don't do that. No. Don't. I Watch don't. Silicon Valley, laugh at it. Laugh along with us. Tell the jokes with this type of stuff. But if you're doing a pitch, please don't do a pitch around Silicon Valley or any movie for that matter. No. And, and don't try no. it with gimmicks. Gimmicks don't gimmicks work. Gimmicks don't work. Everybody there talks. is... It's interesting. I found that my pitch resonated a little better if I added some humor into it, right? I, a little, a little bit of humor is okay. And sometimes it, my it, jokes work, sometimes they don't. So, I get, so you know, <laughs> one of the things that um, we talk about in our philosophy is all malware likes to call back somewhere. Malicious code, when it gets on a system, likes to phone home. I mean, that's the premise of our solution for the most part. I'm right. And I say, unless you're trying to disrupt Iran's nuclear program. <laughs> Now, I think that's funny, and most people think that's funny, but some people don't laugh. I don't know. Yeah, but that's, no, I did a little, so a little bit of humor in the picture there is, you know, he's in the Pied Piper outfit, and he's throwing money, and he's on a unicorn, right? I feel like sometimes, and you see this on Shark Tank, and you see this with all other, you know, other pitches too, like they go way, way too over the top, and yeah, I think that, gimmick, that diminishes your uh, investor's confidence in you if you kind of go, I, I think... Better to be boring than it is to do something overly sensationalized, right? If I had to choose between the two, I completely yeah. agree with and you. And I don't I use my out. Iran joke with everyone, right? Well, I, I <laughs> you think, can hold that back on certain customers. Well, I, I think there's a point to this, though, too, that, that you might be overlooking, which is you've been doing this for 10-plus years. You've, and and I, I've watched you present at conferences. You are a funny person. If you are a funny person, see, my wife doesn't think I'm funny at all. My dude. wife doesn't think I'm funny. That's I think that's part of marriage. I think I'm hilarious. Person, you're funny when you're dating, and then you get married, and you're just you're not, not funny, funny anymore. anymore. No, but um, I'll say some stuff, and I'm like, like Sweden, like that was really kill, funny. Like, you, like, you got to give that one to me every once in a while. Like that was funny. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I, I do that. I'm like, do you see everybody else around us laughing? <laughs> they thought it was funny. <laughs> Like, so you're the minority be, now. <laughs> so I, I think humor is good. Um, it, what I would say here is, is be you. If you have mm-hmm. a natural sense of humor, be you. If you don't have one, then just be good. My be, original, be my good original pitch, Michael, had no humor in it whatsoever. I added a little bit of John and I's personality because John and I present in a, a similar fashion. You guys have some personality, no question. Yeah, and what, I mean, when we present together, like we we jive so well because we both interject uh, the same amount of our personality and attempts at humor um, in our presentation. So I did that, and I, I found it just flows better. I'm more comfortable. The customers. Well, more exactly customer. the real yeah. you comes through. Yeah, and 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 that is going to make those connections. Look, at the end uh, of this cycle, people are going to choose to do business with a person. Because they trust you, because they like you, because you're less of a risk to them. So if if humor is not your thing, don't force it. But but please stop with the with the pictures of Silicon Valley and other types of things because that's not you. That's also trademark infringement, especially if you're trying to pitch your product. Yeah. But you know, it, it's I I just I think there's a way to do it. So I, there's good points in there. There were nine points. I didn't disagree with any of the points except for don't use gimmicks. I, I didn't particularly like that. Right. Um, how about your journey, Paul? How's it going? You're back from the desert. You've recovered. Yeah, I think um, you know I've updated uh, throughout the course of the show. I pretty much updated everyone as to to where we're at. Um, I will say you know if you want to get in on our. Um, we're kind of transitioning from beta now to proof of concept. So if you want to get in on our uh, proof of concept program, uh, you know, definitely send us an email, uh, sales at offensivecountermeasures.com or go to our website and fill out the contact form. Tell them you heard about okay. it on Startup Security Weekly. Yeah, we got to make time for you to bring me up to speed on how things are going and, and yeah, figure out absolutely. how I can help out. 
Um, what about you? I, I had a, I had a couple lessons this week. So the first of which I already I announced. I, I launched. I learned a lot. And by the way, I'm grateful for that. It was a little emotional to get some of that feedback, but goodness gracious, I, I came away. My Tuesday, I had nothing but calls. Paul, people came to me and they said, hi, I like what you're doing. And uh, if you can solve this problem for me, I've got money. And by mm-hmm. the way, when are you going to be able to do that? Which, which is great. But then what I got smart about was I took notes and I would say to somebody, oh, that sounds great. Oh, wait, you know what? Tell me more. Okay, so, so how much would you pay? Mm. Okay, and what would you expect it to look like? All right, well, how would you set it up? And you know what? They, these are maybe their friends, but they were happy to give all that to me. Well, the next call I'd take, I'd say, hey, I just got this idea. Can I run it by you? They go, yeah, absolutely. And I'd run it by them, the whole bit, everything I wrote down. And they would either validate it or they'd twist it or they'd give me some other nuance to it, whatever else. Um, I'm humbled. I'm excited. I am terrified, but I'm mostly humbled and excited. But let me tell you what happened this week. Um, right. So as a startup, I'm using a platform and I, I'm going to keep the names out of it for now, but I'll update people depending on my decisions. I'm using a, a platform for some of my teaching. And, um, and I, so I went up, set up some of the, the, the gateways on it and it didn't work as I expected. And I sent them a note. They promised me I'd have a six hour turnaround time. 28 hours later, they get back to me. And I kid you not, the answer was, well, it's your fault. You didn't do X, Y, and Z. So I went back. I looked over all the documentation. To be fair, it's there at the bottom mm-hmm. in small print. Mm-hmm. So it's my fault, I guess, but I didn't, I didn't feel like it. But, but he ends the message, and this is the founder of the company with TLDR, this will keep happening until you fix it. Mm-hmm. It was just, I was a little pissed off. So, uh, and by the way, we're talking like, it, all it's going to do is delay some money that I get by like 30 days and take 10 bucks out of it. So it's, we're not talking about huge stuff. It was just enough that like, that's how you're going to treat me. So I did a search for alternatives and I found one. Same price point or cheaper, mm-hmm. and it looks like it can do everything I want. But there were three things mm-hmm. that I wanted to be able to do, and this is like, oh yeah, we totally do those. And I'm checking it out, and I'm like, wow, this is a much better experience because of the way that they handled me. Hmm. They're gonna lose, and I'm I'm at their premium tier. I'm right. I'm pretty much gonna make a decision by Sunday mm-hmm. to either stay with them or pull the plug. And uh, today it's looking like pull the plug and go to their competitor. I am. Um, I lost track of how we're doing on time. So th- this could either be a really short episode or a really long episode or somewhere in between. I'm not sure. But I do want to say <laughs> that um, in reading those articles from Medium, from Rad, um, he like in passing in the articles, like I had this problem. I was spending too much time in email. So I got this great thing called Polymail and then just went on with the article. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, I have that problem too. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. We, a lot of people have that problem. I'm like, what is this? What is this? So now I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm probably going to try it out in the uh, lifelong quest to find an email solution that doesn't suck. Yeah, you know what I've been doing? Ruthlessly unsubscribing from just about Me everything too. I can. Holy and crap, we're in sync with that too. To I, did, yeah. I did the same thing. And one of the things I realized is some of my other email that was getting forwarded um, was like ending up in my general inbox. So that was increasing my spam by like two or three times. Do you use Gmail tabs? Do you use the tabs? Um, no, I, I use Postbox. Okay, I looked at Mac. that. And I, I, I ultimately, I, so what worked for me was I went to the web interface. Mm-hmm. And um, and you can use it if, if you use for me iOS or iOS apps. And I now separate it out. And it's funny because I hear people, oh, I had four hundred emails. I'm like, yeah, I got eight today. Yeah. I, and I, I and, and I aggressively stuff. filter now into yep. folders. I mean, aggre- yeah. I have probably twenty five or thirty filters. Yeah, you know what else I did, Paul? Uh, all the games, all the games I had on any of my devices, I took off. Uh, we turn mm-hmm. off the TV every night now. In fact, now we're going to start trying to put down all devices and electronics in the house even earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the exception of Kindles, if you want to read, readings right. always accepted here. Uh, I've gained back easily an hour or two in my day, right? Just by getting rid of distractions. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. Well, Michael, thanks so much as always. I'm glad uh, we're getting positive feedback on the show. Um, yeah, ask more questions. We're here. Yeah, absolutely. You know where to find us on Twitter. Uh, I don't have an email address for the show yet, but you can still email psw at securityweekly.com. Uh, Michael and I will both see that email. So send us your feedback. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you on the next episode of Startup Security Weekly.